Did you ever get the internet up? Okay. The internet's down right now. Does anybody know of an outstanding, trustworthy web internet provider? We have Comcast. See, when the, when the web's down, folks, we're not broadcasting. That's the bottom line. You have to be able to have the internet in order to send out. So just pray it gets up because the people who try to log on today and watch the uh, services and watch the Sunday school, they won't be able to get on. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Brother Gibson, lead us in prayer, please. Lord, once again, God, we love you. We praise your sweet name. God, now take this teaching this morning, God, and touch our hearts. Help us, Lord, to be able to adjust. What will we need to adjust tonight in our lives, Lord, for thy honor and for thy glory? Take the lips of clay once again, God, in the Lord, we In your precious name, we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. All right, turn to Genesis 1-1. And always remember, the Old Testament's Hebrew, New Testament's Greek, with a few places uh, in, in the New Testament of Aramaic and, and some places in the Old Testament that are uh, uh, the uh, Aramaic and the Old Testament. In Hebrew, in Genesis chapter number 1 and verse 1, in the beginning God, Elohim, created the heaven and the earth. All right, now notice that the King James translators gave you a singular noun, God, no S on it, God. And also Hashamayim, which is heaven in Hebrew, is translated in the singular. Notice that. All right. The word Hashamayim can be translated in the plural too. Could have said heavens. In other words, let me say it this way. They could have translated verse 1 this way. In the beginning, gods created the heavens and the earth. They could have, but they didn't, did they? All right, now, immediately you're going to say, well, then the, the translators of the Bible have quite an enormous job before them. Amen. Amen. Okay, amen. And when you, uh, the, the King James Bible is the uh, brunt of all the jokes, the point of vilification, the... Uh, 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 it's just, it's, it's approached as if, you know, it's archaic and a bunch of ignoramuses translated it. And now we're so much smarter than they were. And what we have available today is so much better. But the truth of the matter is, I'm going to show you some things now this morning as we study through the Bible. That's quite remarkable as to how the King James translators translated these words. Which, the word Elohim now, I'm going to show you how it's translated in different ways. It's up to the translators to translate it. You're, you have Elohim in Hebrew in front of you. All right, that's what you've got. You've got Elohim. How am I going to translate this word? You're faced with that situation. How am I going to translate it? Hashamayim. How am I going to translate it? That's heaven or heavens. Then you must be led by the Holy Ghost. You must know the context of what you're dealing with, and you must put it down right. And so now let's look carefully at it. In uh, Exodus chapter number 20 and verse 23, Exodus 20, 23, we, the word comes up again. Exodus 20, verse 23. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. All right, the word gods here is Elohim. Little g in the plural. See? Same Hebrew word. <clears throat> translated in an entirely different way. All right, now go on down to the book of Genesis chapter number 3 and verse 5. Go back to Genesis 3, 5. Genesis 3, 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat, thereof ye shall be, your, your eyes shall be opened, ye shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil. God's little g, plural. So there is a difference between Elohim, who's the one true living God, and Elohim as it refers to everything else, right? Absolutely. Uh, for example, look at Exodus chapter number 9, verse 28. Exodus 9, 28. We're not, we can't take a whole lot of time dealing with the issues involved in translation, but I just want you to see that uh, you, you have a great debt to the men who give you the Bible and to the one who, of course, inspired it. 
Exodus 9, verse 28. Where did the Bible come from anyway? Did it come from a man or did it come from God? It came from God. Exodus 9, verse 28. Now, look at verse 28. Entreat Jehovah, the Lord God, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. Now, the word Elohim is in that verse in Hebrew. Can you guess which word was translated from Elohim into English? What word you've got in front of you? No, Lord is Jehovah, the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vial hey. What word, what? Somebody got it. Mighty. Mighty. Elohim is translated mighty in this verse. Now you're beginning to see the differences of what you're dealing with in the Bible. In the book of Exodus chapter number 22, this will be the last one on this one. Exodus 22 verse number 9. Exodus 22 9. For all manner of trespass, whether it be of ox, ass, sheep, raiment, or for any manner of lost thing which another challenged to be, challenged be to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whom the judges shall condemn, he shall pay double unto his neighbor. Which word in here is translated from Elohim? That's right. Now you're starting to think, see, you're thinking the way the translators think. Exactly. Judges. So you see the word Elohim is translated God, the Almighty. It's translated God's referring to anything else, whatever they may be. Then it's translated as mighty. It's translated as judges, and on it goes. All right. So you can see that the translators of the Bible are faced with a situation where you don't play games. You've got to get down to serious business about what you're going to put in the text. And they had a very serious reverence for, for the Word of God. It says, Take not from this book or add not to it. He said, if you add to it, what's God going to do to you? Yeah. He'll add the plagues to you in the book of Revelation. <laughs> All right. Now, let's go on down with the sons of God in Genesis 6, verse 2. Here we have Elohim, but let's trace this down now. In Genesis chapter number 6 and verse number 2, I love the way the Bible can cross-reference itself. It's a remarkable thing. It's almost like somebody a whole lot smarter than us wrote it. Amen. In Genesis 6, 2, the Bible said, The sons of God saw the daughters of men. They were fair. They took to them wives of all which they chose. All right. The sons of God, the word Elohim here, God, that's a reference to the true and living God, but it's the, the context are sons of God. All right. What are these sons of God? Look at John, chap, Job chapter number 1, verse number 6. We'll put them in a context where you can't call them people. The scripture puts them where there's no way that a human being could fit this, sons of God. Look at Job chapter number 1 verse 6. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. Now did that happen on earth? No, that happened in heaven or the heavens. What's going on here? Well, we have spirit beings coming before the Almighty Spirit, for God is a spirit, all right? And they're called sons of God. In the book of Job, chapter number 38, verse 7, because Job deals with the sons of God, here's something else he says about them. In Job, chapter number 38, and verse 7, when all the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The context is what? The foundation of the earth. In verses 4, 5, and 6, the creation. So it's obvious that spirit beings preceded physical creation. Right? And it's, and it's obvious, as I've said to you time and time and time and time and time again, everything physical that you see or even understand or comprehend, everything, everything physical came forth from an from an, from an invisible spirit being. God. Amen. 
So therefore it came forth from an invisible being that cannot be known, cannot be touched, cannot be found out, cannot be understood, lest he reveal himself, make himself known. He resides apart from his creation. He could have made every, and did make everything that exists. It will exist and continue on. He upholds it by the word of his power, Colossians 1. Everything that is in creation that was created by the creator has its function and its place, but the creator himself is unknown could never be known, could never be found out. 10,000 billion lifetimes, ages upon ages could come and go. And that invisible eternal spirit being would reside alone and they would never know him, right? Absolutely, absolutely. This is why when the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, he manifested him, that being, because he was God almighty manifest in flesh. Okay, now in Job, we have the sons of God. Now we've got a little bit about these sons of God. Let's go back to Psalm chapter number 82 and verse 6. Psalm 82 verse 6. We're coming back to Elohim again. In Psalm 82 verse 6. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Okay, now if it didn't go any further than that, you could say, well, he's talking about men. But there's a problem here. The problem is the next verse. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. All right, these are Elohim, Elohim, gods, translated in your Bible, and they shall die like men. Now, why would it be, if I said to you, you're going to die like a man? Well, that's nothing. I haven't said anything. A man dies like a man, of course he does. That's understood. You don't have to say it. But if you said that a creature that's not a man would die like a man, then you've said something, right? right. Yes, you have. Now, we're not left with that. Come to the New Testament and watch how the New Testament uses that scripture. Watch how the New Testament comments on what you just read in Psalm. Look at John 10. John chapter number 10, in verses 34 through 36. I have yet to see a charismatic... Every charismatic that I've ever listened to as they teach this scripture, they all agree on the same thing. And I don't agree with them, but they all agree <laughs> in their understanding of the scripture. In John 10, verse 34, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you're gods. If he called them gods, now watch carefully, don't jump to assumptions. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of himself, of him, of Christ himself, whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest because I said I am the Son of God? Now you have to have a little more scripture with that to begin to understand what he's talking about. I want you to go to the book of Acts chapter number 7 and verse number 53. Acts 7.53. Acts 7.53. Verse 51, he said, You stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Ghost, your fathers did. And Stephen's doing some good preaching here, folks. Which of the prophets have, your, have not your fathers persecuted? They've slain them, which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you've been now the betrayers and murderers. Who, watch this, received the law by the what? Angels are introduced into the giving or the transmission of the law. Isn't that interesting? That's what it says. And it doesn't just say it right here. It says it in other places. Angels are introduced into the transmission of the law. Now, transmission simply means from the origin, which is God, to the final recipient, the transmission of it, how it got there. All right, now go on to the book of Genesis, chapter number 3 and verse number 19. Let's see. No, Galatians 3.19. I can't read my own writing. No wonder anybody else can read it. So who wrote it? I did. That's why I can't read it. <clears throat> Galatians 3. Galatians 
That's a G-A instead of a G-E. I think it sounded right. Galatians 3.19. Look at this now. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now watch this. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. See the introduction of angels in the transmission of the law? Angels? And of course you can't jump to conclusions and say that you can define the essence of an angel and know all about angels until you let the Bible tell you what's going on with angels. Why would God involve angels in the transmission of the law? That's interesting, don't you think? Look at Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse 2. In Hebrews 2, 2. In Hebrews 2, 2, for if the word spoken by what? Angels was steadfast and every transgression disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now, it's obvious that angels are involved in the transmission of the text. Now, you could come along and say, well, that's the angel of the Lord. Well, possibly, but I don't think so, because it, uh, if it had been the angel of the Lord, it wouldn't have been in that kind of context where in, angels were involved. You simply say the Lord was involved, you know, in the transmission of the, of the law, the giving of the law. Yes, sir? Also, it's plural. It is in plural. It is in plural. In the, in the Greek text, the word angel is angelos, and it's in plural, you know. And most, most definitions of an angel, how many of you heard it this way, is simply a messenger, right? Well, there's far more to an angel than simply a messenger. You can tell that by studying the Bible. There's a whole lot more to the angel of the Lord than simply a messenger of the Lord, right? It's a manifestation of the Lord. So angels become manifestations of, of something. You know, the Bible says that the their angels do be doth behold the face of our Father which is in heaven. Who's he talking about? But uh, their angels. Who, who are their angels? Children. Children. It says, their angel doth behold the face of my Father, our Father which is in heaven. They're angels, you see. And when Peter showed up at the door and Rhoda went to the door, Peter had been in the jail and they were praying for him to get out and then, the, then it shocked him to death when God answered their prayer. <laughs> but he showed up at the door and Rhoda went to the door and there stood Peter. She went back and told him, Peter's at the door and said, no, you've seen his angel. And that's what they said, no, it's him. <laughs> So in any event, the word angel as it's used in the Bible has a much broader meaning than simply a messenger. Certainly is a messenger, but it's far more than that. Right, right, far more. So the angels are involved in the transmission of the law. Angels, spirit beings. And when the Bible talks about you, it talks about you as what is man? Or the son of man? What is a man? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Well, the first one he's talking about is the Lord Jesus Christ. See, crownedest him with glory and honor when he exalted him again. But when he was made, did God create Jesus? Of course not. Made in the sense there has to do with where he was placed, his position. But he was made a little lower than the angels. So we have, a, we have an ascending hierarchy here. We have, we have steps of importance and greatness we have, we have steps of, of higher and higher and higher, you see? And where's the top? It's the Almighty. Could, could the Almighty make an angel and that angel never see him face to face? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The fact of the matter is, the only man in that Old Testament that ever saw God in his, and I don't, I'm not saying in his, co, in his complete essence, but he had a privileged view of him that nobody else had, and that was Moses. That's what he said. He said, I'll speak to him face to face as a man speaketh with his friend. So the spirit world gets very interesting. That's what I'm trying to draw your attention to in here this morning. The spirit world gets very interesting as you begin to trace it. He said they would die like men. So what are we talking about over here in the book of John? We're not talking about men. We're talking about angels. He said, if you are sons of God, angels are sons of God. What are you jumping on me for when I say I am the son of God? When I am the one who the father hath sanctified. See, if angels can be called sons of God, is it, a, is it any, is it a light? It, can you understand how Christ is the son of God? Of course. 
That's what he's saying to them. He's using a comparison between himself and creatures. The Lord Jesus is the creator, not a creature. But the angels are creatures. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. Everything else is a creature. Let's put it that way. Simply. Yes, sir. All right. There are spirit beings. The Hebrew word translated seraphim is not really translated. It's a transliteration. Seraph is the basic noun uh, form of it, and it means to burn. That's what it means, the burning ones. When they show up in the Bible, they show up as a ball of fire crying, holy, holy, holy. That's their purpose in existence, I suppose, is that they are near the holy of holies, and when they fly, they, call, they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, a ball of fire. That's what a seraphim is. If you'll read in Isaiah 6, they took the, the uh, coals of the altar and purged Isaiah's lip. A cherubim, there are five of them. It's the Hebrew word cherub, which is so unclear in its meaning because the meaning of a cherubim has to be found out in Scripture. Ezekiel gives you what one looks like at the time of Ezekiel. He had the face of a lion, face of an ox, face of a man, face of an eagle. Therefore, it is a multi-faceted thing, just like that creature that comes up out of the Mediterranean in Revelation 13, you know, the Antichrist. It is a composition. It's a composite creature. It's the joining together of many. Satan is the anointed cherub that covereth. Satan is not an angel. He's not a fallen angel. He's not a demon. He's a cherubim. And he fell. That left four around the throne of God. Study in the scripture, you'll find that cherubim are the closest to the throne of God than anything else. For they stood and their wings connected inside the very temple, and they looked down upon the mercy seat. When that high priest walked in there in the presence of God, on one hand was a cherubim, and on the other hand was a cherubim. They were in the holy of holies. So that gives them access and privilege to a place that nothing else had access and privilege to. But the thing about a cherubim is that it has some kind of a connection between God and His creation. Because when God made a cherubim with the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle, you have to ask yourself this question. Is that what they looked look like before the first man, ox, eagle was ever made? In other words, before God ever made a man, before He ever made an ox, before He ever made an eagle, before He ever made any of this, did He make a cherubim? Did they have these four faces then? When he made them originally, they appeared that way in Ezekiel, but did they have these four faces originally? If they did, they had the face of a creature that at that time did not even exist. That's something. That's something to think about. Are you following me? How so carefully God is involved in his creation Every detail of every aspect of every moment of history was already settled before, we, before it was ever made. And so the cherubim, the fifth one, the fifth cherub, fell. And when he fell, he became the, uh, the uh, in a sense, a devil, the diablos, the slanderer, the one who opposes God and his work. But his true name is Lucifer in Isaiah 14, the light bearer. Well, that's a, that's, that's a point right there. When you say there's God, then there's the cherubim. Or you can say there's God, then there's Satan, second only to God. And this is one of those things that it's kind of hard to, you can't nail a scripture down that, uh, for example, I've got Gabriel on my mind. And Michael, and Michael contended with him over the body of Moses and said, the Lord rebuke thee. But when it comes to Gabriel, he said, I, his name means man of God. He said, I am the one that stands in the presence of the Lord. And he came and announced to Mary the birth of Christ. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. How would he know what they looked like? Exactly. Didn't have any paintings, didn't have any photographs, did they? <laughs> exactly. Yes, sir. One of five. And all of them were created perfect. That's uh, according to Scripture. Perfect from the day that was created. He's the one who 
God never created anything imperfect. But the thing is about the cherubim is its ability to change its shape, its form, its appearance, what it is. This is why it has four faces. The reason I said that is because in the book of Ezekiel, you see, it shows up in the first chapter, and then chapter number 10, you compare the two chapters together, and you get a, you get a good idea of what's going on with the cherubim. This is why the Bible says Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. In the book of Job, Satan shows up as Leviathan, Behemoth. He shows up in different forms. He's the great red dragon in Revelation chapter number 12. Throughout the Bible, he comes in different forms. He goes through what's called a metamorphosis. Morphe, form, meta, change the form. He makes a complete change. So how do you deal with it? You don't deal with the thing you're dealing with. You deal on the basis of the Word of God. What does the book say? <laughs> That's what you deal with. You've got to stick with the Bible. For he'll deceive you. Satan will sift you like wheat. He'll sit down and talk with you and you two can philosophize together and talk about history and art and culture and all of that and join right in with him. You'll be agreeing with him. And the only, only defense you have against the devil is the word. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right. Now, we've, we've dealt with uh, this. We've, we're, we're talking about the spirit world, but I want to take you on a little further with it now. I want you to go with me to the book of uh, 2 Samuel. Uh, let's see now. Hold on a minute. Let's go. First of all, let's go to Isaiah 26, verse 19. All right. Get that in one hand, Job 26, 5 in the other. Job 26, Job chapter 26. You'll might, Job is a, quite a remarkable book, folks, when you consider the fact that there's nothing else existed when Job was written. And, uh, well, at least wise, when the events in Job happened, there, were, there was no written scripture. And uh, Moses might have written Job. Nobody knows who wrote Job. But in Job chapter number 26 and verse number 19, you talk about an ancient time. Read the book of Job. Job 26, uh, verse 5. I'm getting my scriptures mixed up here. My glasses are fading and, and blurring on me. Jo uh, Isaiah 26, 19. <laughs> Get that in one hand. And Job 26, 5 in the other. <laughs> Whew, if I could see, I'd be in trouble. Isaiah 26, 19. All right, here we go. And then Job 26, 5. I'm not doing too bad for an old man. Good night. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, Job 26, 5. Look at this carefully now. Dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. Okay. Now let's just leave that right there a moment. And, and hold your place here and go to Isaiah 26, verse 19. In Isaiah 26, 19, thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. Watch this now. Awake and sing ye that dwell in dust. What is this? This is a resurrection. The scholars teach they didn't know anything about a resurrection in the Old Testament. Look at this. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs. Now watch this carefully. And the earth shall do what? That's not a resurrection. It'll cast out the dead. Okay. Now look at verse 14 of Isaiah 26. Same chapter. Verse 14. They are dead. They shall not live. They are, and this is the only time the word shows up in the Old Testament, deceased. And it shows up one time in the New Testament. Of course, news, Greek, Old Testament's Hebrew. Watch this carefully. They are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. Now what is going on here? This is some strange stuff, isn't it? All right. Here's what's underneath in Hebrew. Thy dead men shall live. Last phrase, and the earth shall cast out the Rephaim. Rephaim. Strange word to be translated dead. But in the context, it's telling you what's going on. Look at verse 14 again. They are Rephaim. They shall not live. They are the Rephaim. 
they shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. What's going on? Well, the word itself shows up in the Bible. Untranslated. Look at 2 Samuel 5. See, sometimes they translate the word and sometimes they don't. For example, Jehovah shows up a number of times in the Old Testament untranslated. But most of the time when Jehovah shows up in the Hebrew text, the King James translators put capital O, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D to show it's Jehovah. Look in 2 Samuel 5, verses 17 through 18. When the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came to seek David. David heard of it and went down the hole. The Philistines came also and spread themselves, now watch this, in the valley of what? Rephaim. Rephaim. The valley of the Rephaim. It's a well-known place. It's called by another name, same place in the Old Testament scriptures. What's it called? Look at Joshua chapter number 15, verse 8. Joshua 15, 8. Joshua chapter number 15, verse 8. And the border went up by the valley of the son of Hinnom unto the south side of the Jebusite, and the same as Jerusalem. The Jebusites were there first, and David drove them out, folks. And when he did, it became the capital of Israel, regardless of what any Egyptian has to say about it. Amen. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And the border went up to the top of the mountain that lieth before the valley of Hinnom westward. Now, Hinnom is the, pre is the preview of Gehenna westward, which is at the end of the valley, watch this, of the what? That word translated giants is Rephaim. It's translated giants here. You know why it's translated giants in the book of Joshua and Rephaim later on? Because at the time of Joshua, it was so, it was so, it was, it was every day. These people were meeting giants. You remember David went out on the battlefield? Do you remember, the, you remember when he was a boy, the one he killed? Who was his name? Did you know he had some brothers? He sure did. And when he went out on the battlefield, they went out to get him. And the Bible said David was tired. He was worn down from fighting. And they came after him, and one of his men smote them and saved David's life. But they were the brothers of, of, uh, of uh, Goliath. They had a vendetta. It's just like over there in the book of Esther when uh, the, uh, when, uh, when Mordecai, or her, her uncle, had taken her and raised her. But who was her enemy? Haman. And what, Haman, what was Haman? He was an Agagite. Where did he come from then? He came from Agag. Who was Agag? He was king of the Amalekites. Do you remember reading over there in the book of First Samuel? When, yes, what did Samuel do? He, Samuel the prophet, he took a sword, didn't he? And he hacked up Agag. It became a personal vendetta. And so Haman was coming after Esther because she, of course, was a, was a, was a Hebrew. That wasn't her name. That's, that's the pagan name. Nothing, Esther's a beautiful name. Nothing against Esther. But every time they take them off into foreign countries, they change their name to change their identity. What was her real name? Hadassah. Hadassah. It's a beautiful name. It means myrtle. So he came after her to destroy her and to destroy the Jewish people, Mordecai. It was a pogrom. They were going to wipe them from the face of the earth. So what you have here is these giants are everywhere. They're everywhere. And you know something, folks? We have ample archaeological proof. It's everywhere. It's, it, it, I, couldn't, I couldn't cover it in a day of all of the stuff available to show you the bodies, the bones of giants. Unlike evolution, which doesn't have one single step in between their evolutionary process, not one. Amen. We've got all kinds of giant bones everywhere, all over the face of the earth. Pardon? Yes. Yeah, 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 because they reproduced. Yeah, yeah. It's not, they weren't like a mule, you know, where they, where they couldn't. Uh, yes, sir. Of the, the, the progeny of angels 
women, where did they drown? After the flood. The Bible said, and also after the flood. There was a section, a section, a second eruption of them. There'll be a third eruption of them. Uh, the sons of God knew daughters of men. Giants, the word giants in Genesis 6 that's translated giants is not Rephaim. It's Nephilim. Yes, and it comes from the Hebrew verb nafal, which means to fall. They're the fallen ones. They're the ones, according to the book of Isaiah, that God destroyed. He destroyed them. They're not human. They're not angels. What are they? See, they're, they are a mixture. They're some kind of a creature. And God, in His graciousness and His mercy, destroyed them. You've got to remember, friend, there's an almighty, eternal being that, 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 that <laughs> nothing happens. Nothing happens that takes Him by surprise or that He didn't already know. Nothing, nothing. One of the greatest moments of rest in your soul will be when you begin to understand that He is God Almighty and He worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. And to trust Him as Lord is one of the greatest moments of your life when you trust Him as Lord. Everybody's trust Him as Savior. That got you born again. But there's an awful lot of them out there. They call Him Savior. They don't believe Him as Lord. They may call Him Lord, but why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Lordship is not a bunch of words coming out of your mouth. Lordship is when you completely cast yourself into His care and depend on Him and trust Him and trust His providence in your life and trust God to rule your life and give your life to Him. Then He becomes Lord. Amen. Amen. And that's not easy. <laughs> that's not easy, friend. That's not easy. That's hard. Yes, sir. Okay, what you got here is this. Noah means rest. Shem, Ham, and Japheth are the three sons. Shem is the Hebrew word which means name. The, he the, the Hebrew in the Old Testament would not say Jehovah. That's, a, that's the tetragrammaton, and the sacred name. They called it the name, Hashem. To this day they say the name or Adonai. The name, all right. Shem means name. Tense of Shem is where the truth of God is manifested and revealed through the Jew. The oracles of God are through the Jew. Japheth is the second son. He's the eldest of Noah. His name means spread out. Well, they've been spreading out. They've been going to the moon everywhere. Japheth. The third one is Ham. That name means burnt black. Okay? All right. That's what it means. Make anything of it you want to. But that's what the three names mean. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And from them came everybody that's on the face of this earth. All right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, which, it had to be in the DNA of what, at least one of the sons of it, even though it says something, for them to reappear like the lion. Well, you, you're just, you're, you're scratching all around the surface. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> I know you are. You're right on the right track, brother. It's going to spring from there. It's just like in my family. I mean, most of my people are short. In fact, that I'm over, right at six foot taller, must have been a, uh, not only John's, but someone who looked over my <laughs> oh, you were supposed to be a girl. They wanted a girl, and you showed up. <laughs> okay, brother. <laughs> well, did they ever accept you? Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Many of them did. Some of them looked like lions. They had all kinds of weird stuff going on in the Old Testament. Lion-like men, it says. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Strange stuff going on in the Old Testament. Yes, sir. Strange stuff going on today. Yeah. Yeah. Guy jumping up and down on top of his car, stark raving naked two days ago. Yes, sir. Stripping off naked, running around, killing people, eating their face off. Strange stuff going on today. Yes, sir, buddy. The first thing that a savage will do when it gets saved is put clothes on. The first thing that will happen to a, to, a, to a savage that turns away from the truth of the Word of God, they strip off. Right. You can't argue with that. That's the truth. Yes, sir. Man, you're talking about some, yeah.
Yeah. The stones are so big that the modern equipment you can't move. Them. They can't even handle them today, can they? One was already on its way there, it's sitting there, and it shows a man on it. And it's bigger than this church. It's a massive stone. You know, never sat on the wall. Well, there's some images down there in Chile that they showed you the head of for so long. Now they've begun to dug on, dig on down into the ground. They found that it's not just a head, it's a whole body. Huge thing. Yeah. Yeah. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, it says, There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that. Also after that. that they, after the flood. After the flood. After the flood. They continued to fall and have intercourse with women and all through history. And what do you think is going on today? Every one of them. What do you think is happening now? The Bible said three including spirits like frogs and beasts, the false prophet. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. They said that for some reason, while these kids out here today are snorting bath salts. And that's what he supposedly. And for some, did you say that for some reason they are, or you know the reason? They found no drugs in this guy's system. This, this, this one they didn't. This last one, no drugs. But he's demon possessed. There's no doubt about that. Well, he's hallucinating. It's gone full circle. LSD came out in the 60s, a hallucinogenic drug. Now they're back to hallucinating again. What the drugs do is put you in an altered state of consciousness where uh, you, you could possibly be seeing stuff. I'm glad you said that. Yes, sir. When I was uh, studying uh, art, they said that back in the 15, 1300s, they were they would get on these drugs and they would start painting and they would paint these creatures and then they go from one end of the uh, uh, continent to the other and the and the a person on the other side would be painting the very same type of demon and they couldn't figure out. How, yeah, how could they do it? Not knowing each other, completely separated by, by all these miles. Right, and they were painting the very same creature. That's a good question. Darwin would have a hard time with that one. Yes, ma'am. What did you say that Jacob? Spread out. Shem means the name. The name referring to yod He vau He with the Masoretic points. Japheth spread out and Ham burnt black. Okay, anybody, anything else about what we've covered? I didn't even get into the demons, folks. We haven't even got into them yet. Yes, sir. Can't you trace all the giants after the flood back to Ham? Well, that's where this brother was scratching around with right back here. See, he was, he was back there on that, yes. About to have to be his wife, then, wouldn't well, I mean, you've got, to, you, you've got to go back. If you'll notice the first one who brought the world together in opposition against God, what was his name after the flood? Nimrod. Okay. Nimrod. All was 15 feet high, but when you get down to Goliath, he was only something like 9 feet. So, as the, as the uh, uh, DNA was introduced to, to uh, this tribe of people, after the filtering out of the, the, the DNA molecule or genes, when you get down to Goliath, he's a little shorter. But the, but the gene. On, but, but yeah, I know what you're saying. Uh, but the thing is, are all of the giants after Goliath his size or smaller? See, you have to find that out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, you got to find that out. Uh, yeah, there's a progression, yeah. Yeah. but but you got to determine that. Yes, sir. Also, there are more angels that are falling. More They're not finished, and see, this is where the this is the big. Yes, sir. This is a big problem. Most people take the third of the stars in Revelation 12 as have already fallen. Not so, folks. Over there in the book of Matthew, it says plainly, or in Hebrews, it says, Let all the angels of God worship Him. Okay, worship who? 
That meant that the angels had to make a conscious decision to worship that baby in that manger that was the God-man, God manifest in the flesh. They had to choose to worship that baby or reject to worship that baby. That's right, because remember, an angel's a creature. You're a little lower than them, but a little. They're creatures. They had to make a choice to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. If they worshiped Him, they remained holy angels. If they did not worship Him, they rejected God manifest in the flesh. And in the book of Revelation, it says that this war in heaven between Michael and his angels and Satan and his angels, there was war in heaven. And the Bible said they prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So Satan, the accuser of the brethren, is cast out, and with him his angels. His tail drew a third part of the angels of heaven. They, they make that casting out as the original casting out where the Lord said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven, but not so. This is when he, right now, he's accusing the brethren. He has that access. He still has that access, that place where he can accuse. But the Bible says in Revelation that he is cast down to the earth and he knoweth he hath but a short time. Satan knows his days are numbered once he is cast out of that position of, of Job where the sons of God and the daughters, the sons of God, and he's in the midst of them accusing men. The day's going to come when he's cast out of that position. You remember I brought you a message not too long about the pro progressive fall of Satan. Every step of Satan downward until he, find, until he finally winds up in the bottomless pit and in the, and, the, and the bottom of the lake of fire. And that's his, eventually where he's going to be. We've run out of time. Yeah. It says we'll judge him, doesn't it? It says we'll judge him. It says we'll judge angels. So, uh, you know, this spirit world we're talking about here, folks, most of the churches in this country, when you walk through the door, you're walking into a demon-possessed hellhole. And the surest sign, the surest sign of knowing where you are is what they do about the Lord Jesus Christ. A church that is demon-possessed cannot exalt the Lord Jesus Christ the way He ought to be exalted. He is God Almighty. He's the God-man. Everything is lower than Him. There's only one name given among men whereby we must be saved, and He has exalted that name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, if you hold on to that and hold that spirit in your heart and in your soul, you put a wall between you and demons and Satan that is impregnable. He can't cross it. But open yourself up to humanism and self-love and all the rest of that garbage, and you've opened the door immediately for demon possession and demonism. Brother Crane, dismiss us, please.